Amen. So this morning I have an interesting topic that's been on my heart actually for quite some time. Uh, and if I want to give a title to my message is, is what I call it is how to get unstuck. Um, how many of you know if there are seasons in, our, in our, your life where you just feel like things are not moving forward? Like, um, I remember, you know, being a young adult coming out of college, like especially it's just kind of an interesting stage of like, you feel like you just, you're not really sure what you're doing with your life. But um, if you're not in a young adult, don't worry. Like this, hopefully well, this will speak to you because I noticed in my life that there's just even seasons there where I just feel like I'm not moving forward. It could be seasons, you know, at a workplace, uh, in a relational life around you, or, or in ministry especially, where it just feels stagnant and not moving forward. So my, my heart today is to speak into that and encourage you, uh, basically to show you how to get unstuck, okay? But before, before I uh, share, I, I just want to, this one scripture is on, it's just been on my heart. I was listening to uh, a pastor and honestly, I don't know his full name, or I just don't know how to pronounce it. His name is Vlad. Um, he uh, and not not Vladimir Putin. That's <laughs> that's not it. And not and it's not Vlad the Impaler either. Uh, Vlad uh, S. It starts with an S. Like uh, he's in Montana, I think. Uh, does anybody have you know Kathy? I think you know who I'm talking about because I've seen you post uh, stuff. But anyways, he's a uh, He's from Ukraine originally, and he's a pastor. I, I think he pastors a church called Hungry Generation. Um, and he's just a really awesome speaker. But as he was sharing, like, uh, there were some things that I guess you can say I stole from his sermon. Uh, so I just want to give him credit for that. But it just really spoke to my heart. That's, that's the proper preacher way to say it. It really spoke to my heart, so I'm going to echo it back. But he shared this one scripture. It's, uh, this is from James 4. James 4, 8 says... Uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting set of scripture that we quote a lot. It says, James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. How many of you have heard that scripture before, right? Uh, but see, what's interesting to me, you keep reading and, and, and listen to what it says. So draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Like that's a refrigerator scripture right there. But then it says, cleanse your hands you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And I was like, well, that's, that's not something, you know, that you like to put on your fridge. But here's what I was meditating on. Did you notice in life, and this is just kind of my introduction, where when it says draw near to God, you know that drawing near to God is an action. It's, 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 I think you look at the Greek, it's even like doing something in, again and again. Did you notice in life, if you don't draw near to someone, you drift away? Amen? If I think of my college buddies, who used to be my best friends, uh, and where they are today, it's like I, I have absolutely no idea what's going on in their life. Why? Because at one season, we were really close, and since... Everybody moved on with their life and doing different things. We don't intentionally draw near to each other anymore, like how we did in college when we were all at the same place at the same time, hanging out. So we just naturally drift away. And that's nothing, nobody to blame each side. It's just part of life. If you don't draw near, you drift. If you don't draw, you drift. And I think that's really true with our relationship with God. If you are not intentionally drawing near to God, you will, unfortunately, by default, start drifting away. And if I keep going with those scriptures, it actually, if I think about it in light of that, it makes sense what it says in the sentence to continue. It says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You know, I think of my, um, uh, I had a, f a, f a friend or a buddy in elementary school, and, and his dad worked at the train station in Eastern Europe. And I remember he would come to school to pick up um, my friend, and I just always remember his hands were just dirty, black. And, and the reason being is he was a mechanic who worked on trains, and if you're a mechanic, especially when you work with heavy-duty equipment like that, you get your hands dirty, and it's really hard to get it off. 
And he probably washed his hands multiple times, but it takes a lot of effort. Uh, when you get your hands really dirty, it takes the same amount of effort to get them clean. And I just feel like that verse, similarly in our lives, you know, we are living in this world, and, and we have to go to work, and we do different things. Uh, and there's so many things that come at us, at our mind, from the TV, from work, from co-workers, and all that stuff. And if you're not intentionally cleansing that off, what will happen again? You will start drifting instead of drawing near. So, and that's why the scripture goes on, purify your hearts, and you double-minded people. Because really, again, not uh, to blame anything, but it's just part of the world that we live in. It's so easy to end up at that place where you're not drawing near, you're not cleansing off what the word is filling you with, and eventually you become double-minded. So I just want to start with that because if you're struggling to hear God's voice, uh, I just wanted to encourage you with that. that this is the first thing that you need to do is, is draw near. And, and, and here's the thing. Like, this is not a message on how to hear God's voice. I've, I've done lots of messages with the youth group on, on how to hear God's voice. But if you do want to hear God's voice, I said this on Wednesday night. You know, one thing, the first thing you need to understand is, is you're, not, you're not disabled with hearing God's voice. And it's unfortunate that many Christians look at each other or themselves as... I just, hello, Pastor, you got to help me. I just can't hear God's voice. And the scripture clearly says that he's your father, right? Like that, that, that you are his sheep, that you hear his voice. If you, in the physical, didn't hear somebody's voice, you are called, you know, a disabled. You have a disability, a hearing uh, disability. Now, how many of you know if you've been born again, you don't have a disability, you hear God's voice really well. So even asking the question and saying, well, I just don't hear God's voice the way you do. Like that's, that's the wrong question to ask. What you got to first settle in your heart is that you belong to him. You're spiritually born again. You're perfect uh, on the inside. And, and you have the ability to hear God's voice. Amen. And now it's, now it's just your responsibility to draw near to him. And spend time with him because that's where you really pick up on his voice. And this is also what I noticed in my life that you know when God speaks to you, it's usually not lightning, lightning and thunder, and it's usually that still small voice that, that we talk about. So I will even say this if you feel like you're struggling to hear God's voice, he may be speaking to you, you're just not picking up on it, uh, you're just ignoring it. And let me give you one quick example. Some of you know my story, but maybe don't know this one specific part, how I ended up here. I went to school in La Crosse, Wisconsin, graduated with a business major, and the Lord really spoke to me that that's exactly the degree that I was supposed to get, and that's what I'm supposed to do. Well, I got involved with some mission work in college back in Eastern Europe, and long story short, I met Pastor John and these guys in Romania, in a gypsy slum. And they asked me to come and help them interpret for them and all that. And I was like, sure, you know, I'm not doing anything this summer. I'm um, just a college student. So I did that. Okay, that's most of you knew that. What you didn't know is when I gr come to graduation, I graduate. And what does a good graduate do? You apply for anything and everything. Like, I mean, I went on LinkedIn and I filled out an application for everything to the point where I was, one time I actually paused and I said, what am I doing? Like, I didn't even read the job description. It's like, I would, ha I would hate my life if I got this job. <laughs> and, but you're just in panic mode, right? Like, what am I supposed to do? I need a job, I need a job. Um, and then Pastor John approached me uh, and said, Peter, what do you want to do after college? And I said, everything but work at a church, just to be on the, just to clear. I, mean, I think I said that up front. But then, and he just, you know, he just nodded. You know how Pastor John is. He's like, sounds good. Uh, and, but he says, I want you, if you have free time this summer, we, have, we, we go to Hungary often, and I, I, I did this doctrinal teachings on just in English that are, uh, what did he call it, doctrines or, yeah, whatever it was. It was like 19 or 20 teachings 
on doctrine, on solid biblical doctrine that he taught here at River Valley. And what he wanted is to translate it so the gypsies can have solid biblical doctrine. So he said, if you have time, here are all the notes and the audio recording, like an hour each, and translate it all. Uh, interpret it, like voice translate it, and translate it and type it down. Well, that's a lot of work. Uh, and he, but he said, no time pressure. And I was like, okay, whatever, sure, give it to me, right? He gives it to me in a USB. And I'm like, ah, I'm just going to put the USB away. I'm like, I'll work on that, you know, maybe 20 years from now I'll have it done kind of deal. And what do I do? I go back and I said, uh, I start typing and filling out applications for a job and just freaking out. And I'm just getting denied and denied after place after place after place. And I go out to pray, to draw near to God, to spend time with the Lord. Next to my dorm, there was a cemetery, actually. And that, that was my favorite place to go to pray because nobody would else go there at night. So I knew I was by myself, and I would just spend time with the Lord. And I just remember praying and saying, Lord, what the heck? Like, I followed your will. I wanted to quit college and go back to Hungary. I didn't because you told me to. You told me to get this degree, and I did. I changed it from something that I liked, it was exercise and sports science to business, and I, and I did it, and I c accomplished it, and now here I am, and I'm not getting a job, and, and what am I supposed to do? Like, come on, like, can you send a little favor, just, just something dropping off the table towards me, like just, you know, just get called in for something, and, and very gently, the Holy Spirit said, I gave you a job, and boy, Again, it just hit me because I knew exactly what it meant. It meant that USB drive and translating all of those teachings. Now, I say all that because that's just a good example where you may be like, Lord, what am I supposed to do? And, and you're waiting on this. But the thing is, if you know, I don't know if you guys noticed in your life, like God doesn't throw, like he knows that you can't go from zero to 100. He only gives you a little bit and he only shows you the next step and the next step. And anyway, long story short, I spent the next month and I knocked it out of the park. Like I all I did, nine hours long every day, sit in the library and translate those. And then uh, in a month, I handed it back to John and I said, it's done. And look, now I'm standing here in front of you. So, uh, <laughs> so it kind of worked out. So I, I just say that again, just to encourage you that it's, it's usually a still small voice. Amen. Okay, so let's uh, turn your Bible over to 2 Timothy uh, 3, chapter 3. Second Timothy, we can find it right after 1 Timothy, <laughs> chapter 3, verse 1. Um, so I'm going to share, what I'm going to do, I'm going to share three points with you this morning of how to get unstuck. Three probably pretty practical things or encouragement that you can do in your life. If you feel stuck, like you're not moving forward, this will encourage you. Um, and this is point number one. This is going to be an interesting set of scriptures, so just bear with me. This is 2 Timothy uh, verse 3, starting from, I'm sorry, chapter 3, starting with verse 1. But realize this, that in the last days, how many of you know we are living in the last days? Difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving. Uh, I mean, look, look at, I mean, just look at a little bit this list that goes on. I don't even have to read the whole thing. Treacherous, reckless, lovers of pressure. Uh, holding on to a form of godliness, but not really interested in real godliness. I mean, you know, it's one of those scriptures that us as Christians like to quote for, like, the word, right? Like, look at this. This is what they're doing out there. <laughs> you're wondering where I'm going with this. Now, did you catch that one word that was in there that said ungrateful? Or in other translation, it says unthankful. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like a pretty hefty list of things that like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that. And then there's one that just says, and people will be unthankful and ungrateful. And it's like, 
It just reminded me of a Hungarian joke, and I'll, I'll, I'll translate it to you, and we'll see if it translates well or, or, or it doesn't. Uh, th I remember this hearing in a Hungarian church. I don't know if one of my pastor friends came up with this joke or, or whatnot, but he said, he says, Moses is coming down from the mountain of Sinai and bringing down the commandments, right? And he's carrying them down to the, to the man of Israel, and the man of Israel come from to <laughs> say, so he's like, so, Moses, how did it go? And he says... Well, boys, I have good news and bad news. Which one do you want to start with? Well, let's start with the good news. Well, Moses says, I was able to negotiate down the 20 to 10. So, hey, that's great. What's the bad news? Well, the do, the do not commit adultery is still in there, unfortunately. <laughs> Some of you like that more than others. So. Or maybe can relate more or whatnot. But, uh, but uh, here's the thing, going with my point from Timothy, like the, you lead that ri list and you're like, check, 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 I'm good. But when it gets to unthankful, it's like, wait a second, Paul, did you really mean to like throw that in there? And he did. I mean, it, it's in there, right? And it's like, it's like, did you know, like, the first step to, like, start drifting away from God is to be unthankful? If you want to be, if you want to get unstuck in your life, here's my first word of advice for you. You have to be thankful. You have to be thankful. Somebody approached me the other day and said, Peter, I see you have uh, some kids now. Uh, so I'm, I'm a sh and I hear you're a pastor. I don't think this was somebody from this church and said, so I'm sure those parental or parenting analogies are coming out, right? Like this is about the time. And I said, well, not yet or, or not really. And then, you know, I, I was thinking about this and I was like, well, I think I got one. I think I got, I think I got a good one. That's pretty simple, right? Like here's my toddler sitting at home and she just finished eating and she wants an apple, let's say, which is one of her favorite treat. And I say, okay, let me get you an apple. And I grab the apple from the fridge and guess what I do? I don't start walking towards my toddler. I start walking towards the sink, right? Because first I got to wash it, then I got to cut it, take the seed out or whatever, and then hand it to her. Uh, and there's two types of reaction that happen. The one, <laughs> and where you probably can tell where I'm going with, is she sees me walking away from her, although I want to bless her with this, right? I don't want her to eat dirt. I need to wash. I don't want her to eat pesticide stuff, although we buy organic, so we're good. Uh, but I just want to wash it. It's just courtesy of washing an apple. But because she sees me uh, walking away a little bit, she turns absolutely what I would call unthankful, throws a hiss of it, throws her plate up, throws her cup down, throws herself back. And now, now, because you're not having a thankful attitude, before I could even bless you with this, I have to take you on a timeout and tell you that we're not, like, this is not the proper reaction. And, I, and Daddy wants to bless you. You just have to wait one minute, right? Uh, but how many times do we do the same thing with God? Especially when you're stuck in a situation where you feel like your life is not moving forward the way it thought it should by now. And you just, we just have that attitude of like, well, just totally unthankful. So the first thing you need to do is start being thankful. Amen? That's a really easy but yet kind of difficult thing to do. Start being thankful. Uh, did you know that being thankful does not depend on your circumstances? There's a story in the book of Acts in verse 16, 25. You guys probably all know the story. Paul and Silas gets thrown into prison. Yeah, and, they, and in the prison, and they start, it says they start singing hymns and praises to God. Now no, notice that, that singing praises to God, magnifying the Lord, thanking Him, does not depend on their circumstances. So let me just encourage you with that. Being thankful and lifting up His name does not depend on what you're going through right now. It does not depend on your circumstances. Being thankful, it shouldn't be a reaction of your circumstances. It should come before anything else or around you. Amen? Uh, Ephesians 5.17 uh, says this. Uh, it talks about, well, let me read it. Ephesians 5.17 says, so then, 
Paul talking to you guys, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. How many of you know, want to understand what the will of the Lord is in your life? Amen. And do not get drunk with wine, um, but, fill, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual song, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, sometimes I realize in life you cannot be thankful or you have a hard time being thankful because, well, here's the key, is because of your or perspective, because of the situation that we're going through. I remember in one season in my life, I was working uh, with some people in ministry, and I was, I be, well, let me just say it this way, they kind of hurt me in a really not good way. Like, although I was trying to do is help, and I started, as any Christians would, I would argue, I started to develop an attitude against them, saying, like, here I am trying to help them, and they're just hurting me, right? And, and I was not thankful at all. And how could you be in a situation like that? Until the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And you know what the Holy Spirit said? The Holy Spirit actually showed me some things that happened in their life previously where other people really hurt them. And the Holy Spirit said, Peter, if you did the same, if the same thing happened to you, you would probably act in the same way as well. And you know what that did to my heart? It changed my perspective fully. And I was, I was able to be, stay thankful for them and for the ministry and, and keep doing whatever we had to do. And I just say that because, again, if you're stuck in a situation and you have a hard time being thankful, you just got to draw on the Holy Spirit because you may need a perspective shift. You know that being thankful is a matter of perspective. How many of you heard the book, The Hiding Place, or read it? Quite a few. Uh, you guys are very educated people, man. Like the last time I was asking like books that I thought I was the only one who ever heard of, it's like everybody raises their hands. and like, okay, I guess I'm going to be able to teach anything new. But The Hiding Place, who, who, who Corey, is that? Corey, ten, boom, boom, boom. Well, the Dutch would say bomb, or, or the Hungarians. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, so for those of you who don't know this story, it's a Christian book. They're spirit for Christian. World War II, they get thrown into the work camps and death camps because they're hiding Jews in their, in their place, uh, in their house. And, and that was a crime at the time, and that's why they get thrown in there. And there's a story in there about the fleas where where the barracks where they're sleeping on top of each other, literally there's pictures of this, there's just tons of fleas that are just biting viciously, right? And like every night or, you know, every time you're in there. And, and the sister, uh, it's Corey and her sister, and, is, and one of them is not thankful at all. And they read one of these scriptures from Ephesians that says, be thankful um, always. And it says, how could we be thankful for this, you know, for the fleas? Uh, in a situation like that, and like, well, the Bible says it, so we just have to be thankful. So they prayed out loud, and then later she finds out that the reason she can bring a Bible into the barrack and preach the gospel to everyone in the barrack is because, well, there's no, the guards, the guards to that certain barrack wouldn't, would rarely go in or wouldn't even go in. And then one time they had to call on a guard, or she had to call on a guard, and, sa and the guard said, I am not stepping in there, uh, and says, because of the fleas, I'm not going in there. So then she runs to her sister and says, see, this is exactly what we're talking about. Like, you can be thankful no matter the situation. And this is the beauty of it, that God can turn any desperate situation uh, into something that's actually to your advantage. Uh, in the kingdom. Amen? I don't know how he does that, but, but he does. Um, and he's pretty good at it. <laughs> One last thing, and I'll move on. Exodus. Now, this is going to be, this isn't going to be a good one. This is, this is something that, like, spoke to me, like, on another kind of level. And I said it to my wife, and then and whenever I become unthankful, she reminds me that, uh, of these set of scriptures. This is uh, Exodus 14, and it says, 
well, a little background. All of you know the story. Uh, the uh, Hebrews, or the children of Israel, are coming out of Egypt, out of the captivity. And again, just to put it into perspective, I said this before, but just so you can picture it and relate to it, that Egypt was the most powerful empire at the time. And imagine the Ten Commandments that we watch in kids' cartoons and, you know, the Prince of Egypt and the great movies. But I'm like, can you actually really imagine it, that happening in front of your eyes? That the living God is bringing the most powerful empire to its knees by his sovereign hand in a sense of you're not, you don't even have to do a thing. He's doing these ten plagues right in front of them and, is, and, and, and brings the Pharaoh to his knees and says, get out of here, right? So that happens right in front of your eyes. And then you come out to the wilderness and then you approach the Red Sea and what happens is a pretty desperate situation where the Pharaoh changes his mind and is pursuing you guys now and there's nowhere to go. I mean, it's, you're totally stuck in a, you're stuck, <laughs> right? In a corner, there's the sea in front of you. You can't go back. Not just you can't go back. They're coming with the army to wipe you out, basically, or at least all the men or whatever they were going to do and just take the women and the children back. Or uh, That's just my thought. But I don't know what they were going to do. But this is where we join in with the story. In Exodus 14, 3, it says, When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his servant had a change of heart towards the people. And they said, what is this that we have done? We have let Israel go from serving us. So he made his chariots ready and took his people with him and took about 600 select sell chariots and, uh, and it goes on and they start pursuing them. Okay, so let's jump down to uh, verse 10. It says, and the Pharaoh draw near to the sons of Israel uh, near, and the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. And then they said to Moses, Moses, is, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And I will just say this, again, going back to the ten uh, plagues. You know, how many can relate to that? That you can actually see the mightiest, greatest miracle in your own life. And if you don't stay thankful, if you don't keep your mind on the Lord, you can forget about all that and be in a situation like this where it's just like, Lord, we're dying here. I know you brought me a long ways, but now I'm in this stuck situation and we're dying here. And look at this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip a page. I'm not going to read what happens in the story. Uh, you, if you have a bigger Bible, you probably don't even have to uh, flip anything. And all you see is verse uh, 15. It says, the song of Moses and Israel. So without not, I know all of you know the story, but without not knowing the story, I'm going to leave some stuff out, and I'm just going to read this. It's just a nice little song. It's a nice little praise that I'm just going to read to you. It could have been one of the Psalms. It says, Then Moses and the son of Israel sang a song to the Lord and said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has come to my salvation. This is my God. I will praise him. My father's God, and I have exalted him. I'll just jump around it. Jump down to verse 6. Your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your excellence, you overthrow those who rise up against you. The enemy said, I will pursue, and I will overtake, and I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be gratified against them. I will draw on my sword. My hand will destroy them. Then 11, it says, who is like you? Among the gods, O Lord, who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working in wonders. You know, I'll stop. I can keep going, but I'll stop right there. Here's the point. I heard this at Karis. That's the right song, the wrong side of the river. Amen? Is, can you apply that in your life? Like that song should have been sung on the, instead of crying out to Moses, what are we supposed to do? 
I mean, obviously we know the army gets destroyed, but what I'm talking about, this is the song you need to sing before you see the victory, before you see the deliverance of the Lord in your life, before you get unstuck. First, you got to start singing this and being thankful and focus on the Lord, and He will make a way. Amen? Praise the Lord. Point number two, be faithful. Let's say you're in a stuck situation. Uh, why don't you flip over to Luke 1.5. I'm going to share something from Luke that just kind of dawned on me the other day. Again, kind of a familiar set of scripture, but not something that we usually think about when we just glance over this. This is from Luke chapter 1, uh, 5. This is the story. It says, the birth of John the Baptist foretold. And this, is, this story is about his Zacharias, his father. And it says this, in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, uh, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijai. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of the Lord God, walking blamelessly in the commandments and the requirements of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Again, what we see herself is a situation where somebody's stuck, right? They're, uh, they just, things didn't go the way they thought it should. Whatever the situation, maybe fill in the blank. But now read verse 8. It says, Now it happened while he, that's Zacharias, was performing the priestly service before God in an appointed time, uh, order of the division, according to the customs. Basically, an angel of the Lord appears to him and shares the news with him that you're going to have a son. It's going to be John the Baptist. He's going to prepare the way. And then Jesus is going to come, the Messiah. Uh, who everybody has been waiting for. And again, just so you can relate a little more, imagine living in that time, 400 years is what they say of silence. There's no big prophet who arose. They're waiting on the Messiah. Uh, so they're waiting on these big promises of the Lord. But this guy, Zacharias, in his own personal life, is just waiting for the promises of God to be fulfilled in his own personal life. And in verse 8, it said this little thing that just jumped out to me. It said, while he was performing the priestly service. Catch that, that the angel of the Lord spoke to him when? Right in the middle when he was doing what he was supposed to be doing, when he was faithful. And when I read that, I just started thinking through the, some of our heroes of faith. And isn't that sometimes the common denominator? Like you look at Moses, what was he doing? He's shepherding the sheep he's chasing probably some of the sheep and then he bumps into the burning bush doing doing something being faithful what he was entrusted with at the time in the middle of it is that's when God speaks to him notice that he, that he doesn't sit back and says Lord I'm just waiting for you to speak today but no he's being faithful out David when when he gets when he becomes anointed as a king when he's a shepherd doing the little thing that he was in charge of, being faithful with that little that he got put in charge of. Gideon, all right, I'll stop, but I can keep going. Uh, same story happens, right? Luke 16, 10 says, obvious, very obvious verse that we all know, faith, being faithful with li little or being faithful with much. Who spoke these words? Jesus. He said, if you cannot be faithful with little, who will trust you with the true riches? If you cannot be faithful with the unrighteous wealth, who can trust you with the real stuff? Amen? So yeah, that small thing that you're seeing in your life, that maybe that small voice that the Lord just said, okay, some, I'm going to throw something out there, serving the cookie ministry. Okay, that's not a backhanded thing because I am trying to promote for the hospital the ministry thing, volunteers, but I'm just using that as an example, okay? Like, just that small thing that you're supposed to be doing, well, being faithful with that, the Lord will probably speak to you while you're performing that duty that he called you to do. Amen? You know, many times is what I hear from Christians is, is um, well, you know, I just, 
it's like I just don't have that much, or what am I supposed to do, right? Like we overlook, overlook uh, what we're supposed to be faithful with, whether that's our work or ministry or, or whatever that small thing is. When uh, when Mark six says uh, six forty one, actually, this this is Kairos. Maybe you can put up Mark six forty one behind me. I'm not I'm not gonna go there for time's sake, but it just always speaks to me so much that here are the disciples of Jesus, and they. They encounter a situation of lack. This is the story of multiplying uh, the fish and the bread. Um, And put up actually, uh, what's the verse before this? Uh, Okay, what is the verse after this? 42. (laughs) Okay, that's not it. All right, well... What I'm looking for, if you open your Bible, it's somewhere, it's somewhere in there, I guarantee you. Um, the disciples encounter a need, and, and there's all these people sitting. You guys all know the story. And, and it says, we got to go home. There's thousands of people. they got to be fed. And Jesus says, you guys feed them. And then what do the disciples do? They automatically look at the natural and say, we got nothing. And then somebody says, I don't know if it's the boy, the young boy, or one of the disciples, well, that's not, that's not totally true. Like, we have something. It's just so little that they overlook it automatically. And it's, we got this boy who just donated, you know, a couple of fish and loaves of bread. But what is that for 5,000 people? But I guarantee you, I do the same thing in my life. And I'm like, well, I'm just waiting for this grandiose word of the Lord to come. Uh, when you already spoke that little thing, and you do have something, you just, you just got to be faithful with that something that he already spoke to you. And that's when really the more responsibility will come. I mean, that concept in the Bible is just all over the scriptures. Uh, Moses, again, at the sea, uh, at the story that I just said, it's like they're crying out to the Lord. And even Moses is crying out. And, and if you read the scripture, it says, Lord, the Lord speaks. What are you crying out to me? What do you have in your hand? And he says, oh, yeah, I got this staff when he got anointed back on. It says, strike the water and boom, the sea departs. Um, Elisha and the widow, we all know the story, right? Uh, widow starving to death. Elisha goes to the widow and says, what do you have? I got nothing, dude. I'm poor. I'm dirt poor. Uh, except jars and a little oil or whatever. And Boom. The blessing is where? It's on that little something that you already, God already gave you or have. So you, you just have no excuse. And this is really my point. And this is what I notice with Christians is like, and, and the word especially, that we just always hide behind the excuse. Well, I got nothing. Like, I just, how could the Lord bless this? Um, I, let me just say this. I'm, I'm going to try not to offend anyone. Apparently, I'm good at it is what I was told by other staff members. <laughs> but did you know that God cannot bless uh, welfare checks? Like if, if you're sitting on welfare. Uh, there was a story that happened at a church in Budapest that we used to go to. And there was a lady in a, in a, in a wheelchair who was genuinely paralyzed. Uh, for decades she has, hasn't stood up. And there was, a, there was a service and they were laying hands on the sick. And somebody pushed her forward, and she uh, got up after 20 years, stood up on her feet uh, from the wheelchair. And then she looked around, and you could, uh, my dad was there to see it, I believe. I wasn't, but my dad tells me the story that her face kind of changed and like scared and sat back down in the wheelchair. And then didn't stand up again. And then they pushed her out. And then I think the elders went to talk to her and said, what's up? Like, why, why did you sit back down? Or what happened? You know, did you feel like your legs got weak? Something. And then she was honest and she said, no, I, I realized that I, I been in Hungary, there's a disability check and I've been living off disability. And if I get out of this chair, I'm not going to get the disability checks anymore. And, it's, and it scared her because she didn't know any other provision in her life uh, for the last 20 years. So she sat back down in the wheelchair and stayed there. Uh, but how often do we do the same thing in our lives where we say, well, Kairos, can you put, have, well, before you put up the picture, has anybody heard of Nick Vujicic? Uh, 
Put up that first picture of him if you can. Now, you may recognize him. This is a guy who has no arms and legs. I mean, what kind of a quality of life would we be talking about if, you know, I, I would argue if most of us, if I told you, hey, we got to cut off your arms and legs, then most of us would say, just turn off the machine or, you know, just kill me, right? Like, like th there's no quality of life without limbs uh, for most of us who are healthy. We would say that. And here's a guy who has no arms and legs. You can flip to the next picture. And he probably lives a most fuller life than most of us. Uh, he's a motivational speaker because you know why? what he realized? When he, I heard his story. When he was young, he tried to commit suicide by drowning himself in the bathtub. That was the only way he could think of committing suicide. It's hard to commit suicide when you have no arms and legs. And then the Lord spoke to him. And he came out of, dealt with heavy depression, right? I mean, you can imagine. He's like, I'm never going to have a girlfriend. How, if, how would I even hold my girlfriend's hand? I have no hand. How, I, how can we walk down, walk somewhere together, hand in hand? Like, I can't do these things. So, so he's trying to kill himself. And the Lord speaks to him. And you know what he realizes? He's like, I have no arms and legs, but I have a mouth. And the guy is a motivational speaker today. You can flip to the next picture. Not just that, he has a family, uh, multiple children, because he realized that, yeah, I can gripe and complain about what I don't have, or the Lord can bless what I do have, that's something, and that's what he's doing. He's traveling the Word, and he's a motivational speaker, and speaks specifically, well, speaks to Christians and churches, but to people who deal with depression, uh, because what depression really does is it just makes you look at the what you don't have, and the now, and just locks you in on that. But he helps you get out of that perspective. I mean, his life is a walking testimony. No, no pun intended. <laughs> He's awesome. He makes jokes like that, okay? Uh, just so you know. And anyways, all right, moving on. Okay, one more thing about this being faithful because I, I do believe that, again, that's the second key if you're feeling stuck to get unstuck is being faithful. But did you also know, and here this is a strong point that I don't hear preached very often, that being faithful doesn't just mean that you show up. Like we, we have this idea in the Christian church, well, being faithful just means I'm here, I have a pulse, you know, I'm checked in, although mentally checked out, but I showed up. That's not being faithful. Tell that to Joseph. You know, Joseph, from the, if you guys are familiar with the story, he was sold into slavery where it says his manager entrusted him because he saw his faithfulness, basically. He saw the favor of the Lord in him. But I will argue his manager didn't just see, oh, Joseph, he, does his, he gets his stuff done. No, he saw something that stood out, and that's probably that Joseph was faithful, meaning he didn't just get done what he was supposed to get done, but a bunch of other things. And that's when his manager was like, well, you took care of that too. I'm going to put you in charge of that, and that, and that, and then before you know it, well, you run the household. I don't even need to be involved. And you see that in Joseph's life in the prison. He gets thrown into prison. I will tell you, like, you, in the prison, we know the story. He gets promoted to the chief. He's in charge of all the cellmates. He probably didn't get promoted to that position just because he cleaned his own cell. Like, again, he was faithful with his stuff in prison as well, but he probably went above and beyond. So being faithful means not just getting the minimum done or not just showing up. I think that's something that I need to hear or that being faithful means that you go above and beyond with whatever you touch, and the Lord's blessing will be on that. You know, there's this concept, and this kind of goes back to, to, to Nick, uh, to the motivational speaker, that many times in life we feel like, well, life is not fair, right? And, and we get stuck in that, that, that life dealt me a cards that are just not fair. Like Nick, the guy with the limbs, could really say that, like, Lord, this is not fair. Like, can you just bless me and give me what I don't have? Because this is not fair. But have you ever know, realized that it's not about 
God is not giving out fairness. He ne- I don't see any promise in the Bible where he said, yeah, just keep praying, keep confessing, and I will bless you with fairness and get that back into your life. No, sometimes things don't come back to your life, but he will bless you with favor. And there's a difference between fairness and favor, right? Again, the, Nick, the best example, like, he's, he didn't get his arms and limbs and, and legs back, but he's, there's a favor on his life because he took what he did have and he was faithful with that. And God's hand is on that and he can bless that. Amen? All right. Moving on. Last point. Uh, number three is this, and this is going to be short. So first you are thankful, then you're faithful, and then my last point I wrote down is be fruitful. And what do I mean by that? Because I think that's always the one thing, well, well, if I can just figure out how to be fruitful in ministry, in life, wouldn't that be awesome? But really, what, this is what I wrote down under this point. You know, Eddie Hamori was here uh, a few months ago now, and maybe it was Sunday morning, I think he was speaking, and he said something that just really bore witness with me. And he said at one season in his ministry, he was really struggling. Like, I was at the beginning of his ministry, and he's like, I'm trying, I'm, I'm, it's like, I'm not, my ministry is not going anywhere. And he's just whining and complaining. And he shared the story that it was his, his um, father in law, who was actually a, a famous Hungarian preacher, uh, he turned to him in the middle of his complaining and said, Well, Eddie, you know, sometimes you just got to get on the bike and start moving. Uh, a bike that you're not pedaling, it's, it's not going to have momentum. It's not going anywhere. And when he said that, that really spoke to me because that is so true in our lives. You know, where, 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 where we feel like we're stuck, it's just, it's just not going anywhere, and we're just waiting on the Lord to do something versus start pedaling in a direction. And God, is, he can give you direction way easier when you're in motion. Amen? When you're moving, it's way easier for God to give you direction when you're just sitting still. You know, I think of our church planting. And again, I'll be honest with you, and I know I can because John is not here. Debbie, don't tell him I said this. But at one point, I was really struggling with the whole church planting ideas and the vision of the valley. And, you know, we, for those of you who are new, we have a vision to plant all these churches in the St. Croix River Valley. It's insane. Right? It's crazy. It's not insane. It's God, okay? And, and I was really struggling with it, thinking, like, what are we doing? Like, we can barely fill up this place, <laughs> you know? Like, and now we're planting and sending people away from this place. And, and then I think it was my wife again who reminded me that, you know, like, I used to complain a lot that I felt like we weren't doing enough. And my wife says, well, Peter, now we're doing something. And, and I was like, you're totally right. And, th- and this is exactly what we're seeing happen. We, s- we start moving, and I'm not saying, you know, it's probably not done perfectly uh, compared to the perfect uh, handbook of how to plant a church. We're probably not doing it perfectly how you're supposed to, how the mega churches are supposed to. But we are moving, and God can steer you way easier when you are moving. Amen. A ship, how is the saying go? A ship at sea is easier to steer than a ship sitting at the port. Amen? One last testimony, and then, and then I'll be done. Uh, because I just want to testify about my brother, Domi. How, how many of you were on the mission trip and maybe met Domi? Would you just raise your hand? Yeah, there's a few of you. So I have four, uh, three brothers. There's four of us brothers. And Domi is my youngest brother. And I will, uh, so I have two older than me and then Domi. And Domi was born like eight years later, I think, than I was. And I'm, I was the youngest brother for a long time. And I got beat up a lot. I got bullied a lot because I was just, you know, I was just the uh, uh, smallest and, and the tiniest. And when Domi was born, I, I, I'll be honest with you, like I always like looked up down upon Domi because Domi was born, um, I would say, with a disability in a sense of he had some heavy, serious uh, learning disabilities. Uh, he was, I would say, kind of on the borderline autism. 
And not just that, ever since he was born, I think his kidneys started to shut down, so he needed surgeries right away. Then just weird stuff would start happening in his body. Like his knees are, would start to swallow up when he was like eight, and he needed steroids to bring them down. And we weren't even Christians at the time, so my mom was trying everything, uh, taking uh, Domi from doctors to the best specialist around the country. And, and, and so there was physically a lot going on in his life, and praise God, ever since we, our whole family got saved, most of the physical stuff he's completely healed off. But what I want to share about is, is um, mentally, Domi was always, like I said, he had uh, learning disabilities. Like, to give you an, an example, I remember he was excused from math in high school, or in, even, in, in ele- even like early on. And again, <laughs> me being the older brother to Domi, I'm like, how do you get excused from math? Like, one, one, who gives those out, and can I get one of those certificates, you know, where it's like, I don't need to take math classes anymore. Um, but one of the specialists, like doctor that, that spoke to him, said these words, and they didn't, they didn't mean it in a bad way, but they just said the facts. They says, this kid will never graduate high school. Uh, and it was at the time, and it really was looking like it, okay? Well, Domi, being Domi, uh, you can show the first picture uh, just to get a, a visual of him. So Domi, uh, one day he like, came up with this weird hobby, okay? And his hobby was that he was going to go around and meet famous people and get their autograph. Like, who even does that today? And you can go to the next picture. Uh, but he took it to a level where, yeah, he would go to the theaters, famous Hungarian actors, or famous Hungarian Olympic athletes, some, you know, whenever maybe sometimes he bumped into some famous uh, foreign uh, actors or whatever, like he would stand in line and have like a nice printout picture and like get their autograph. And this, what you're seeing in the picture, like it, he, this hobby developed so much that he, he, started, he had like an exhibition is what they call it in the, in the um, culture center in, in our hometown. You can go to the next picture and like he had interview with like different, like the mayor and city leader and like talked about his interest and his weird hobby. And I remember there was a article in the local newspaper about Domi, Domi's like a strange hobby or something and, and this, this picture of him uh, that he was doing. But here's, here's my point, like he's, again, like something that is just almost silly, just doing something, right? Like just instead of sitting at home and accepting the way I am, I'm never going to graduate high school or whatever, what they spoke over to me or whatever my circumstances, it was just doing stuff. Well, he graduated from high school, actually, uh, and he, he, and not just that, he, then he went to college. So what college would he go to? He says, well, I feel like a calling for the Jews. So there's a famous... Uh, Jewish, uh, like a Hebrew college in Budapest, and he, this was the only college he got accepted to because they have pretty low attendance, and, and he went there, and he got his diploma in some Ju- Judaistica or, or whatever it's called, uh, which is like, again, at this point, I am still scratching my head like, what are, okay, that's cool, you graduated high school, that's awesome, yeah, praise uh, God for it, but I'm like, what are you going to do with the diploma like that? But again, Domi's mentality is just like he's just, he's just being faithful with whatever he is given. Well, come graduating to college, you can switch to the next one. This is a picture of the National uh, Music Academy, Franz Liszt. Uh, in English, you would say Franz Liszt. Franz Liszt. Some of you heard of that name? He was a Hungarian composer. Uh, that's the National Music Academy. There is a job opening here for uh, a librarian. And there's about, I don't know, two, three hundred people who applied for it. Uh, and guess who got the job? Uh, s- switch to the next picture, would you? So this is how that looks like on the inside. All these famous people, all these famous people come and play. And the job is to get the uh, music sheets for them and set up for practice and all that. It's a, it's a librarian. Cause they, switch to the next one. I think there's a... That's, that's my dad there. That's your take your dad to work with you that day. Uh, all right, switch to the next one. And yeah, so uh, there's Domi being busy on his cell phone. He's probably getting a phone call. And I think there's one more where, yeah, so his job is to get the 
stuff for all the famous composers and stuff, which, how did he get that job? Honestly, I don't know, but I think there was some favor. There was some favor involved, and it could have been from a strange hobby, just doing something, you know, just doing something. God can bless, God can bless that. Amen? Amen. All right. Father God, I just thank you for your word today. Lord, I thank you that we are not people who are stuck. If there's anybody here who feels like they're stuck, Lord, Lord, we just change our perspective, Lord, and we, are, we, are th we want to be thankful people. We want to be thankful, and Lord, we want to be faithful with what you have entrusted with us, and Lord, let us look at what we have, not what we don't have, and we know that the favor of God will rest on that, and you will bless the work of our hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.